Thank you for that introduction there. And we're going to do it as a double act. So I'm going to introduce it and give some general overview in terms of how Cardiff and Vale Medicines Management Team um, use one of the new indicators and how we did some change in practice. And then Alan's going to give some practical experience of actually doing some patient reviews um, and sort of give it from the clinician's perspective and also a bit from the patient's. So the anticholinergic burden indicator was introduced as a national indicator back in 2017-18. So I sit on ORPAG, um, so obviously I know about these indicators, um, know how they're sort of developed and take it back to the health board and then try to think of ways with the people I work with in terms of how we can um, take it forward and do some work with practices. So anticholinergic burden, there's been some information around for a while. This information here is taken from um, a paper written by AWMFG, um, prescribing support for prescribers. And it just gives the purpose of what we're trying to do in the fact that drugs with an anticholinergic burden can increase your risk of confusion, falls, they're associated with increased risk of dementia and maybe with mortality. But it's observational data. But actually, as you get older, it's probably good to look at these drugs and do medication reviews and talk to patients about these drugs and why they're taking them. So in Cardiff and Vale, what we did in 2017-18, as with many health boards, we have a prescribing incentive scheme. Um, we use prescribing indicators in the incentive scheme. For quite a few years now in Cardiff and Vale, we've actually uh, had a range of indicators that practice can choose from. <coughs> But what we've done, we've actually got them to concentrate on two or three indicators only. So each practice, what we do, we take all the indicators that we're going to use that year, we rank them across all of Wales' practices. So we rank them into the bottom quartile, the top quartile, and the two middle quartiles. And we try and get practices, or we encourage them, to do indicators or look at indicators that they're not performing as well on. And we've done that for the last three or four years, actually, and, and done a sort of a narrow focus from a wider range. Um, obviously, for 2017-18, um, they then get um, some points awarded for that indicator and actually equates to a financial award for that practice. So, in 2017-18, we actually included the anticholinergic burden indicator within the incentive scheme. It was compulsory, so actually they had no choice on this indicator. All practices were asked to look at it. It's a slightly different indicator to some other indicators in the fact that it pulls data from Audit Plus, so actually interacts with the patient record a bit more than some other headline indicators that sometimes are a bit blunt. Um, and actually, the other thing about the indicator is that because it was pulled from Audit Plus, it was only available at a cluster level. So actually what we thought we could do as well, we could get the cluster to work together on one particular prescribing issue, so that worked well for us as well. And then also what we asked the cluster to do was for them to meet, so it was one GP from each, um, from each of the practices in their cluster, also probably involved um, the pharmacists working in practices and prescribing advisors um, to discuss the cluster data gain understanding of the indicator and look at what causes and what contributes to the indicator. So actually, soon after we started sort of talking to practices about the indicator, um, we encountered some issues with the Audit Plus data. So it wasn't actually pulling off what we thought it was pulling off. And it was identifying, it was supposed to identify those patients that had had um, a recent prescription on repeat of a drug that had an anticholinergic effect score of three or more, but it wasn't doing that. It was actually identifying people that had stopped amitriptyline six months before. Um, so we decided to change what we did, change our approach mid-year, and then rather using the actual percentage that each cluster had as um, a baseline than trying to get them to improve, we changed our approach and asked each GP practice to physically have face-to-face -face reviews with 10 patients in their practice um, um, over the age of 75 and has an anticholinergic effect on cognition score of three or more. Um, the way we identified those patients was actually going and doing searches. So we picked those drugs that had a score of three or more, so mainly amitriptyline, mainly oxybutynin, and identified those patients 
and ask the practices to do face-to-face -face reviews with those patients. We had um, meetings with all the clusters across Cardiff and the Vale in the summer and the autumn. Um, and at that meeting, there was a short um, presentation on, based on the evidence as to why we wanted practices to do this. It was given by one of the prescribing advisors and it was based on the prescript information and their presentation that they did. Um, practices were asked to bring along information from their consultation. So actually at that time, most of them had done the work for that indicator and reviewed patients. So there was productive discussion at the meeting. There were some questions about the basis of the evidence. There were some questions about the scoring system. And like if you're on amitriptyline 10, is that the same as amitriptyline 50? So for me, it's all about doing a medication review with that patient. And general feeling was that the face-to-face -face reviews were patients were beneficial. So in terms of results overall, we had lots of results sent back to us and we had lots of scoring systems. But for me, um, you know, counting the score of what somebody was on before and afterwards is not really that relevant. But across Cardiff and Vale, so we've got now 65 practices, was it 64? Some have merged recently. So there was actually 677 patients had face-to-face -face reviews and they were on 966 medicines that had an AEC score. They were on more medicines than that, but we just asked for information about those that had an anticholinergic effect on cognition score. And then after the review, they were on 659 medicines contributing to the AEC score. So they stopped 260 medications. 157 were amitriptyline, 30 were oxybutynin. They changed 66 medicines um, to a medication of a lower score, so 17 amitriptyline, 31 oxybutynin. They reduced the dose in 128 medicines and there was no change to 507. And then there's a few patients at the end that were under secondary care, so we wanted further discussions with secondary care as to what to do with these patients. As well as sort of sending information back about individual patients and what they did, um, we also asked practices to sort of fill in lessons learnt. So I'll let you read the quotes there on the screen. I'm not going to read them out. But um, these are some quotes um, taken from what people thought about lessons learnt. Okay. And also, we asked um, themes to be identified, and there's a bit of overlap here between the themes and the lessons learnt. So, you know, people said a lot of the medicines weren't working, but patients were left on them before they had their reviews. Um, many patients were having side effects, but they were unaware it was due to the medicine. This came up quite often, the fact that people were started amitriptyline for a pain indication, and that might have gone away, but actually they're then using the amitriptyline to help them sleep. But sometimes, because it wasn't documented at the beginning, it was hard to actually tease that out without speaking to the patient and finding out from them. Talked about poor documentation of effectiveness of the anticholinergic of the medication reviews and opportunities to reduce or stop medication may have been missed previously. So very similar themes all the way through in terms of the results we had back. So I have put this slide up here which shows, um, it's from an AWTTC report from December 2017 and it shows um, the score or the percentage of people over the age of 75 on an anticholinergic effect medicine of three or more as a percentage of all patients aged 75. So Cardenfet is the only health board that's gone down. But for me, I must admit, I don't like this as a prescribing indicator myself. So but I've had put it up there to show that you, know, you have it as an indicator, but then how, what you do within a health board doesn't necessarily mean that you, know, you, you can have, then improve your score. But I think this is an individual patient review personally for individual patients. And what you do with the patient is very much dependent on individual patients. But there is the evidence there to show actually it has helped us in terms of reducing the number of people over the age of 75 on these types of medicines. 
And then also what we do in Carla from the Vale, we don't tend to do things a one year only because it just takes time to affect change. So we have included it into incentive scheme this year in terms of those people that had a face-to-face -face review last year were asking practices to follow up, not necessarily face-to-face, -face, maybe with a telephone conversation or just check their notes. If they did stop, have they still stopped? Are they okay? Just to sort of get a feel for what we did last year to you know, learn something more going forward. So we haven't yet started to do this yet because we're starting to do our, me our meetings with GP practices, but just trying to find out and get a feel for what happened to these patients one year on. Okay? And I've got to hand over to Alan, who's going to give you some practical experience Thank of you. doing it in a practice. Thanks very much. Thanks, Fiona, for that. Um, basically, that's an introduction to anti the anticholinergic burden area um, in, in general. Very, very, very important areas we've seen. We've started looking at that in, in Cardiff and Vale, and uh, Fiona's given us the introduction to that there um, in general. And as she says, I've, I've taken that forward now and actually reviewed individual patients, and that's what I'm really going to be talking about. But I want to return just a little bit to how Fiona began about looking at evidence and essentially this interest in this area has grown from about 2011. Quite a lot of research has been done but it has to be said with looking at these important areas, um, decreased cognition, possibly dementia, without, without stressing it too hard, the actual level of association between these drugs and those areas is best described as moderate and certainly some researchers have described it as weak. Um, I think that is important to bring up. Just looking actually just a little bit to the middle of this slide, the latest BMA paper April 2018, so very up to date, shows the chance of getting diagnosed with dementia if you're taking these drugs is something like about 15% and lower than that if you're looking further over a period so not, not that strong. And to me, the first thing that brings up before we even getting into talking about reviewing patients is, is that something of a dilemma then about telling these patients about these possible associations or not? And certainly some, some prescribers in Cardiff and Vale from meetings we've had, cluster meetings, have been somewhat negative about even mentioning it to patients. So I thought I'd just raise that point. Um, but to me, I personally do think it is, worth, it is worth mentioning. You might think it's a weak association, but we do talk about other weak associations to patients constantly. PPIs being a massive example in question with regard to fracture and increased susceptibility to clostridium. So I think it is worth mentioning. That's the first thing. And of course, then basically patients can make an informed decision. You put information towards them. Excuse me, looking at this. So we've decided we're actually going to mention this to patients. How do we begin to get side effects like this across in medication reviews? Well, personally, I've done it by talking to patients about the general side effects of drugs with anticholinergic side effects, if you will, but by beginning to introduce the side effects that are known, so things like dizziness, sedation, confusion, but then beginning to introduce the concept of possibly, and it's very important here to stress, it's a possible association, they can be possibly associated with, excuse me, decreasing cognitive function and possibly dementia, and getting that across in terms of making sure they understand what you're talking about when you talk about cognitive decline, how they think, how they see the world, understand the world. So from there we can then, a process I should say of shared decision making can begin so you're now beginning to get that information over to the patient and that what happens next really depends on what the patient thinks of that information, what, you know, what, what it means to them, are they acting on that quite positively right away, you could call it positively, are they reacting to it, do they actually want to do something about the drug they're taking quite quickly. Also the drug involved, it really depends I think in terms of the drug, is it having a subjective or do they see the effect of it more subjectively, is it more objective that can have a bearing on what happens next and also how effective the drug is currently for the patient as well. That might be more relevant if their diagnosis is newer and the drug is quite effective. They might not want to go near changing it at all but if, if as Fiona has touched on, if, it, if it's historic and they've had it for a long time, they don't really know if their pain is controlled because 
pain is control the drugs controlling it or has it gone away, they might be more amenable then to, um, to changing. So that's introducing, introducing that. Fiona's already touched on which drugs we're looking at here. And essentially, with all the plus not giving us the data we needed, we decided to go down the line of searching. And we knew, essentially, we'd be looking at drugs that are strongly anticholinergic. So we basically searched under amitriptyline, oxybutynin, found those patients, invited the ones in that were willing to come in, and started doing medication reviews with them. These drugs are both highly anticholinergic. They both score at three on anybody's scoring system, basically. There are different scoring systems that score drugs differently, but they are both strongly anticholinergic, so essentially reviews have been led by those drugs. So, some cases. Number one, this lady is an 85-year-old female who's got um, a history of trigeminal neuralgia. She's on 10 milligrams of amitriptyline, She's been taking this drug since November 2007, so she's been on it for 10 years. All of these um, patients, by the way, were reviewed last autumn. So 10 years on this. But interestingly, on talking to her, she's got no pain at all at present. Nothing. Nothing there. Start giving her the, all the information about the possible side effects, what's the cognitive decline, possibly, etc. And this then triggers her to start reflecting on the fact that her, her memory is not terribly good. So that kind of led into her being quite positive about being willing to reduce and then stop. And that was affected without incident over something of the order of about five weeks and she had no return of pain at all. You'll notice now I've gone to red type. That's because a few weeks later she gets some back pain and a GP puts her back on amitriptyline, most unfortunately. So I then got in contact with the GP and alerted them to the fact she had memory issues and they were more than willing to then stop it and use something else to control her back pain. But I think that does raise the issue about all prescribers being aware of the possible negative cognitive effects, if you will, of these drugs. She's actually then been subsequently referred to memory clinic. What, um, what points does this first one bring up for us? She's not symptomatic. Management is easier here with this patient. It's, it's something we can get into and affect relatively simply. As usual with amitriptyline, we should reduce relatively slowly. It doesn't have to be reduced that slowly. A few weeks, not too much of an issue there. There's more impetus for this woman to be interested in changing. It's easier to affect change because she's got memory issues as well. So it kind of feeds in positively to her. I mentioned there about making sure all, all prescribers should be aware of the potential negative effects of anticholinergics. And SCAN has subsequently revealed that she does have vascular dementia. So this, has been, this, this lady's been followed right through. I'm going to move on to our second one. This couldn't be more different, to be honest. Really the converse of the first one. Similar kind of age, 84-year-old female. Now she's taking a mixture of uh, neuropathic agents, if you will, amitriptyline, 25 to 50 at night. That's been since April 2002. And she's also on progabalin as well. She's got this kind of working diagnosis of perineal neuralgia. But to be completely honest, they're not really quite sure, is what I was getting from the notes on this lady. Her pain's not well controlled. Her diagnosis is not completely sorted out by any means. And she's had all sorts of nerve blocks. Lo loads has gone on with this lady, but it's really quite difficult. On talking to her, though, about the the possible negative effects again of amitriptyline, she's been quite willing and quite interested to try to reduce, reduce the dose of that. I see her then a few weeks later, but it's actually made her pain worse. So this, this, this isn't all positive by any means and can be a bit more difficult to manage. At that point, I've advised her actually to see the GP for further management now. So she's seen the GP and they've increased her uh, sorry, her progabalin gradually then to 600 milligrams but my final consultation with her still finds this lady not well controlled with regard to pain 25 of amitriptyline i think at this point she's actually taking 600 of progabalin or really quite a high dose and um basically in the end here she's getting referred to a, a gi specialist this 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 whole pain thing is kind of somewhat vaginal somewhat rectal very mixed picture so, 
What are we finding with this lady? Management is much more difficult here. The, patient, the patient's still in pain. And I think it could be argued probably by a lot of people, and I think other cluster pharmacists across, across Cardiff have, um, and, and the Vale, have probably cross-tapered more uh, patients that are like this. And I've got to admit, I, I didn't do that, but I'll come on to why. So it, maybe it would have been more relevant to drop her amitriptyline, increase her pregabalin at that point. But personally, I take the view that where people have been on something like amitriptyline for such a long time, how do you know what's going to happen when you start reducing the dose? They might not have been in any pain at all. And you could say, ooh, is that a slightly ethical issue? Should you really be reducing doses of drugs and you could leave a patient in pain? Well, the other side of it is she's quite willing to reduce as well. She's quite interested in hearing about the side effects, quite willing to reduce. So I think it was a fair enough approach. You notice there I've passed the, kind of passed the prescribing back to the GP because it does raise issues with non-medical prescribers about how comfortable you are with the prescribing of certain agents. And, you know, if you're going to get into prescribing gabapentin, pregabalin, you've, essentially you've got to know what you're doing, haven't you? What are the side effects? Dosing in renal dysfunction, etc. So possible training need there for anybody getting into this. I, I, I kind of mentioned there about what, what's the priority in this case, really. You know, I'm sure a lot of you might think, well, should that have been touched in terms of reducing amitriptyline? Wasn't the pain more of the issue? So it's a bit of a debatable on this. She's been subsequently seen in a functional bowel clinic by a clinical nurse specialist, this lady. And this, the nurse, I thought quite interestingly, has really co concentrated on this lady's constipation because she's quite convinced, I think, that she's not fully emptying her bowel and consequently that's leading to pain. Yeah, very, very interesting. I thought it was somewhat valid, I have to say. So she's really talked to her about increasing fibre, uh, Pos positional effects for emptying the bowel, all sorts of things like that. So that's going to be quite interesting to follow up. But that's really quite different. This is number three. To move into a bit of oxybutin in now. This is a 78-year-old male being treated with oxybutin for urinary incontinence. This is from September 16. But he's not finding this very effective at all. So again, it's relatively he's easy here with the patient being quite positive in response to learning about the possible side effects, negative side effects to switch this gentleman to trospium as per our standard Card Cardiff and Vale um, approach, if you will, for um, overactive bladder. But on follow-up, he's actually slightly worse. So again, you might question this again, but he's not, he's not bothered about that because one, he wasn't well controlled anyway, it, and he's quite all right with staying in this position because of the possible anticholinergic side effects from the oxybutynin. So at the present time, he's carrying on. That's very much an example of patient choice here. Just a little bit about that. As I say, I think it's quite valid to switch anticholiner or to switch agents here because he's not, he's not doing very well with the drug itself. And the actual information, giving him the information, sorry, about possible side effects, has been powerful enough for him to carry on with the drug, which is essentially not, not helping him so much as the, ox uh, um, the oxybutynin was but he clearly needs to go on and be referred. And as Fiona said, all of these people are subject to follow-up. So it'll be interesting to follow. And finally, number four, this is a slightly different case again, a 91-year-old care home resident. Now this gentleman taking oxybutin, and again, you might raise your, raise your eyebrows at 91 and oxybutin, something of a no-no as we, as we know with the very elderly and quite frail patients with this drug. But he's also got a urinary, urinary catheter in situ, and he's suffering with bouts of confusion. So talk to the GPs, talk, talk to the staff at the care home, and we all thought with this, with confusion, etc., much, much more sensible to get him straight off this. No problem at all. And, and his confusion has really quite improved without it. And of course, he's got a catheter in situ. Just want to mention a couple of points about that. This looks like a fairly solid case of stopping the drug it's clearly helped his bouts of confusion. So one small caveat to this, which I haven't really seen when I've stopped anticholinergics in patients with catheters, and that is if once it's stopped that they actually possibly suffer with bladder spasm, that can be an indication for starting a similar drug again. Obviously not, not oxybutynin, but something else. Um, but he hasn't run into any of that, so stopping the drug, so that's, that's all well and good with him. Just some, just some final points. 
No, sorry, that's gone too far, excuse me. Should be one in between. Oh, that's strange. That's right, something's missing there. There was something, there was one other in between. In other words, I just wanted to mention about scoring um, on anticholinergic burden scales because all of our scores are derived from the anticholinergic effect on cognition paper. It was, um, I think, Delia Bashara was the head author. It's in the International Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry. So that's where that's from. But my, my, main, my main message really is probably stuff you might well know something of already, and it's basically just prescribing anticholinergic drugs with great caution in the elderly, especially in frail elderly patients, patients with complex multimorbidities. And these are our friends for really keeping a very close eye on oxybutynin, amitriptyline, but nortriptyline, low fepramine, all of these tricyclic antidepressants as well, toltiridine, peroxetine, older antihistamines like chlorphenamine, uh, diphenhydramine, and protorperazine as well. So my main message to everybody looking at these drugs is review your patient and share the information with them. Let them come to an informed choice. Thanks very much.